You go right on. Hey, hey, Luke chapter 6. Um, again, as we do here, we do a narrative. The, the Gospel of Luke is a narrative. Uh, he is, um, whether it be that the Gospel of Matthew, we know is the, one of the uh, first recorded Gospels, that was already out there, and uh, then the book of Acts is written, and then Luke comes back to write uh, for Theophilus the, a more clear distinction of, uh, of what he's already heard, or if the Gospel of Luke was uh, written first and then on in the book of Acts. But it's more likely, uh, doing a timeline there, that Matthew was written, Acts happened because Luke picked up on that, and then he came back and he gave a more thorough uh, examination. Luke's account is one of the Gospels, and again, we have it, most likely he interviewed. And again, when you read the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, he interviewed people. So the things that are in the Gospel of Luke are those that ascertain fact. Those that he went to the... Uh, he was the original Snoops.com. All right? Got to give you a little information on Snoops.com. They did an expose on Snoops.com. It's a guy and his wife in his garage. Sometimes they check Wikipedia for information. And Wikipedia checks Snoop.com for information. Uh, so sometimes there's a little breakdown. So just because someone sends you something on the internet and says, well, I checked snoops.com, and uh, it's not false. A lot of times, well, not a lot of times, uh, a good percentage of the times, their facts aren't even as well uh, documented or checked out as themselves. So, Acts 17.11. That's the snoops for all of us, right? Be of more noble character than the Bereans, right? For they searched the Scriptures intently and daily, finding out what the Apostle Paul said was true or not. So even past snoops.com, you can look at some other things. But again, go and search these things out for yourself. That's what the Gospel of Luke, that is what Dr. Luke has done. That's why there's certain things that are in Luke that might seem similar in some of the other Gospels, but there's a little bit more detail. Like in Matthew and Mark's account of this man with the withered hand, it doesn't even tell you which hand, it just says a withered hand. Luke goes so far as to say his right hand. He's finding the detail. Quite possibly, maybe he found the withered hand guy. I mean, that's the guy who's going around and says, hey, I was a withered hand guy. I mean, that's sometimes what happens. I'm just talking from human nature here. Sometimes we go around and say, hey, the Lord did this, the Lord did this, and look what the Lord did. Look at me, but look what the Lord did. Look at me, look what the Lord did, but he did use, he used me. Look what the Lord did, look at me. And that, because, and again, maybe I'm not alone here today, but I've done that in my own life as well. And so the thing that just comes down for you and I today is, is that we look at these, uh, the, the gospel accounts. This gospel meaning good news. And I encourage you to read. Next week will be chapter 7. Read it every day. It takes about five minutes. Come up and do your whole things. I mean, uh, and again, for those of you who want to do your own reading and submit it, email it to me. and if, We might play a best of. And if you want today's reading, just email me because we don't put that one online. If you want today's reading, I'll send it to you. But... Here's the other thing. You can get lost reading from chapter to chapter. Wait a minute. That's chick. You were supposed to read. I'm a chapter and verse kind of guy. Remember, chapter and verse wasn't put in. It's around the 8th or ninth century. Especially then with the onset of the printing press. And so really, again, the Gospel of Luke, if you're taking notes, is a narrative. He's going from event to event and not necessarily in chronological order. He's going and says, look, I can't verify this statement, but I can verify this over here because I've talked to that person. And that's so much so, so much so that you know Luke's account is very detailed because how does he arbitrarily just come up with the withered guy's hand, the right hand? He has got to go and get that detailed uh, information. You have to be able to, uh, to uh, explain with much detail. And so here we have these accounts here that, uh, again, it happened that on a second Sabbath after the first. I don't know necessarily where that is. We're kind of lost on that one. But go back with me. To verses um, uh, 37 of Luke chapter 5. And this is what I mean, if you just leave off from just at the end of the chapter, this continues on into chapter 6. And again, if there's questions for you that aren't answered here today because you've been reading, say, chapter 6 all week long and you've come out, and that's what I encourage you to do. Get in the Word of God. Read chapter 7 next week. And if at next week's message I don't answer the question, email me. And here's some of the questions that came up from last week. Who's he talking to in verses 27 through 39? And mainly verse 39. And no one having drunk of the new wine immediately desires uh, uh, new, for he says the old is better. Wait a minute. We know that Jesus turned water into wine, and that was like the new wine. That was like really good stuff. What is this whole thing? If you get stuck on verse 39, go back and read the verses before and in context. And then you cross-reference that with the other scriptures. What did the Pharisees, who he is talking to at this time, and the scribes, 
What did they say in the other gospel accounts about this? Is he, he's talking about, he just trashed us. He's just talking about us. And the thing that's going on here is that you don't want the new. That's the indictment to the Pharisees, to the established religion. You don't want the new. Here's, this move, here's something that's happening that's brand new. There's people receiving their sight. People are being healed. The deaf are hearing, the blind are seeing, the dead are raised, the lame are walking. Everything that John the Baptist is even talking about, that one who's coming after me will do. These things are happening, and they've never happened before in your lifetime. Remember, since Malachi, Radio God, or actually at the end of Second Chronicles, the Old Testament stops. The last Old Testament prophet, if you want to get technical about it, is John the Baptist. He seals and finishes up the Old Testament. He, he is that prophet. But Radio God has been turned off for 432 years. And there has been no miracles. There's, there's just nothing supernaturally happening at all. Nothing that's recorded in the histories. And you can go and read in the Catholic Bible, the Maccabees, and stuff like that, but that's actually Jewish history. And you can read those things, and you can hear about the Maccabean Revolt and all this stuff, and you can hear about uh, Hanukkah, you know, the lighting of the candles. There's, the candles. there's certain miraculous things that happen, but, but what has happened in Scripture as far as the things that, that God wants to communicate to you and I, these things haven't been going on. And again, as we, you read here, or you heard this morning, they were enraged at Jesus because He healed on the Sabbath. By the time Jesus is online here, there's this thing, I can't even pronounce the name, it's some writings of the rabbis in the Mishnah. There are 39 things that qualify as work that you're not supposed to do on the Sabbath. And as it begins here in the Gospel of Luke chapter 6, they're going through the grain fields and they're getting the corn or that, that part of the wheat. And as they're going through the tops there, you're, they're crackling it, they're holding it, and it comes out and they put it in. And if, you, if you've eaten the wheat or whatever, and you, you crack that kernel and you start chewing on the wheat there, it turns into like a gum. If you swallow it, it swells up, fills you up. If you chew on it, it kind of satisfies for a little bit there. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it talks about that you can go into people. You can't, you can't harvest. You can't go in with a sickle. You can't chop down the wheat and start taking home. You, just if you're walking through, you can go through anyone's fields and you can do that. You can sustain yourself and satisfy but there's no reaping. But then they're accusing, you're doing this on the Sabbath. Now here's the tradition of man. God says, look, you're hungry, go eat. God has some simple things. When you're hungry, eat. When you're tired, sleep. And you know, He's designed our bodies that way. I've noticed that there's some involuntary things of mine that if I don't take care of them, they will, do, they will turn on themselves. And so those are the things that, the, that, that they're just thinking. Praise God that we have involuntary organs. I can't say beat, heart, beat. I can't be talking to you and concentrating and making my heart beat at the same time. Blink, eyes, blink, eyes, breathe. And what if you forget how to breathe? And that just happens at that moment or whatever. So these are the things that God does for us. But the same thing in the natural on the sense. Look, you're hungry. Here, go through the grain fields. Go eat. Just do that. But you can't, you can't harvest. You can't just bring it home for the folks. Bring all the folks out to the field if you want. They all want to eat, but they all got to harvest on their own. In other words, they got to do that. But here's, here's the tradition of man. They come up and they said, look, if a person on the Sabbath takes wheat to feed themselves. In other words, God established a law that if you're traveling, remember, there weren't no essays. I mean, super America. So there weren't any essays, all right? There weren't the convenience stores. And if you're traveling from one place to the next, there's plenty of fields going on. There's... Just eat. It's just the law. It's just God has established. But the rabbis in the Mishnah, they're 39. They come up with 39 things. One of them is if you spit on the Sabbath, that's, that's working because your spit will hit the ground. There's dirt there. It moves the dirt. Thus you're plowing. Okay, so now it comes to this. They said if you pick a grain of wheat or pick any fruit, you're reaping. And if you crackle it open, that's like threshing. They're that detailed. I don't know, in our day and age, we say those people are having a cute case of tight underwear. <laughs> we have a, a tight tunic or something. I don't know. But, but they're, 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 that's their interpretation. So I want you to understand, when Jesus is speaking His Word... Every time they get mad at him, they seek to kill him. What are they going to do? They're enraged about him because they're coming against their traditions. And look, that thing about traditions, I want you to understand that, that when you're trying to legislate morality, when you're trying to do these rules and regulations, that is a power trip, folks. And Jesus is coming against all that they teach, but they're, and they're not teaching the Word of God. 
So they're saying you're, you're plowing or you're reaping and you're threshing and you're doing these things. And all of a sudden, again, even the last chapter, they always keep saying, well, what about John the Baptist's disciples in the last chapter? What about John the Baptist's disciples? You know, his disciples don't eat and drink or whatever. I mean, they, they fast in those things. What about you? Well, first of all, you didn't accept John the Baptist. And now you're using him as a test case? No, you can't, you can't have it both ways. And so this verse right here, look, you're not, you, you can't understand it. Verses 27 through 39 of, of, of Luke chapter 5. You can't understand this. This is new wine. You're not, you are saying, I want the old. I want the old. And I know this about it. The sinful human nature. Even the one saved by God's grace like me. And, and, and this is advice I give to other pastors. Don't make little changes here and there. If you do that, people will, for whatever reason, if they want to leave the church or they have any kind of excuse or they got there, or they just, you upset their little comfort zone there, uh, they'll have something to anchor on and say, look, look at this. Save them all up and make a whole bunch of changes at once. Because if you make a whole bunch of changes at once, it's hard for the group to get together and get a consensus. Well, I, I need a group that I don't like. I, I'm of the don't move the chair committee. Who wants to join my committee? I mean, you're not saying a committee. You're not out there with a sign-up seat. But I don't like this. You put 50 changes out there at once. You, you know. Now, I learned that from jail. If you just get the inmates fighting with each other, they forget about the guards. Now, again, you can apply that in ministry. But understand that this is the thing. He's coming against all their traditions and what they're teaching. And understand this. This, this breaks my heart. The pure milk, the pure teaching and the milk and the nourishment of God's Word is not getting to the people. You might read the Old Testament and say, Oh, kill, kill, kill. Let's not bicker over who killed who. And there's all this death and destruction. Annihilate them. No, no, no. You're missing the God of grace. I used to think that way until I started studying the Amalekites and the Philistines, and why they needed to be utterly obliterated because of the sexual immorality that you can't even... Com- it is just a- you need to wipe the people out. Don't, don't have one thing left over from it. You need to cleanse that because it was a representation of sin. You know what? That's a graceful thing. How many of you enjoy leprosy today? Well, you don't. Because an unfortunate thing happened, leprosy, that, what do you, you needed to quarantine that. And then there's Leper's Island out in Hawaii, Molokai, and, and you can do that. But now they found cures. They called it Hansen's disease. Now they found cures for that, to, to stop that. Same thing with smallpox, polio, uh, polio. Anyone enjoying those things? Those things, and unfortunately, someone got that. They would need to be quarantined. And that's all it takes. Now I practice that in my own life. Some of you might enjoy coming to church sick. I don't. I mean, my kids have grown up. You're sick. Go to your room. You're quarantined. Here's vitamin C. There'll be no hugging. There'll be no slobbering, kicking. You're not drinking off of my thing. There you go. It's all yours now. And, and what happens is my kids get well sooner, and then they don't spread the disease to somebody else, and thus they relapse because their immune system is already wiped out. That's how syphilis the bubonic plague, all these other things that ravished Europe were cured because they said, look, we need to quarantine. We need to separate them. Bummer, it's you. One of the reasons why leprosy continued to flourish in Hawaii is because people took it personally and they wouldn't want to report or or a family member wouldn't want to turn somebody in who had leprosy to put them out on that island. But that was really the only thing they could do at that time to stop that. Changes is coming. Looking at, well, what's, uh, what's in it for me? So here's this thing. Putting this new wine into old wineskins, look, if you can't do if you're not, in the whole context of the message, if you're not pliable, look, you can't put that new piece on the, onto an old piece because when it washes and it shrinks, it, it tears it. It ruins it for, for all. Those are some hard decisions to make, but understand this. It's you, you Pharisees. It's you, you religious elite. It's you... Th- who are so looking at And now, as we read through, and hopefully you've read through, at least a few times, if not every day, this last week, you let these words resonate in you. And, and Jesus clearly tells them, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. You should have a day of rest. Work six, rest one day. You, you should. And if you don't, then you'll experience S.O.D., Sabbath on demand. Your body will shut down. 
And, and it's unfortunate if you take that Sabbath while you're driving. It's unfortunate if you take that Sabbath, that Sabbath on demand while you're working, some power tool or something like that, or heavy equipment. It, your body will just shut down, and, you, and, that, and that's it. But God says to work those six and have a rest. But if not, He knows us. He designs our bodies in certain ways. They, they will shut down. But understand the context is here is that the Sabbath was made for man. It was meant to bless and to benefit us. Just as you look at all of the Ten Commandments, just as you look at all the 613 literal laws, they were meant to bless and preserve each and every one of us. Probably one of my favorites is until 1954. You've got to remember after the Industrial Revolution, when people started moving off the farms and, moving, and, and, living, and living in cities and stuff. Babies were born at home. Midwives. In 1954, a doctor discovered, a Jewish doctor, discovered doing a study that one out of three male children were dying in, in hospital births because they were circumcised. This is 1954, folks. You've got to remember, in 1901, a doctor discovered, hey, you know what? Doctors should probably wash their hands after they visit the morgue in the basement and then start going up and touching patients all the way up in the hospital. It wasn't until 1920, later in the 1920s, almost 1932, before that was accepted practice. It used to be a mark of distinction to have, doc, have blood on your sleeves as a doctor. They would visit the morgue where there's all these, you know, nasty stuff there. And then they would go. And the next ward, the first floor, was the uh, pregnancy ward. That was standard in hospitals all the way up. And people were dying. This doctor discovered in 1954 that it takes eight days, listen to this folks, eight days for vitamin K to build up in a newborn. Vitamin K is what hemophiliacs don't have. That's not a dirty word, folks. That's someone who, who can't control their bleeding. In other words, they get cut there shaving, someone cuts themselves shaving. There's no way to coagulate. There's no way of the blood clotting in the system there. Many of us guys are thankful for that when we're shaving. But, but they can literally bleed to death. And, it, and so what happens now is they'll just drop vitamin K in the baby's eyes at birth and they're ready to circumcise within a couple of days or so, or actually. But it takes eight days. What a coincidence! God set up, you shall circumcise on what? Excellent Bible students there. He didn't explain vitamin K. He didn't explain the immune system. He set up a law that was meant to preserve us. And that's all you have to do is obey. Because if you trust the one giving the instructions, what does it matter, the instructions? It lines up with his word. He's the one who's established the words. I'm not talking about blind faith here. He's the one who gives the instructions. So he does a year-long study, and he realizes in Jewish and Muslims, the mortality rate, even those born in the hospital, dropped nearly almost 99%. There was no death. There was no mortality. Not one in three. It just significantly dropped. And then the following year, he did more studies. Just think of all the babies that, boy babies that died since then. But he did another study, and he would wait the eight days. And that's when they discovered, when they did blood tests and all this stuff, vitamin K. That's when vitamin K shows up. It's at its highest level. And that's when a baby can withstand circumcision. A, day, a boy baby can withstand circumcision and vitamin K. Now they drop it in because of syphilis and other venereal diseases. That's also something that they drop, the eye drops in vitamin K. So if you're having children, you might want to talk to your doctor about that. But understand this. God's law, God's word is meant to preserve you and I. Now, now with understanding the eighth day, do you kind of go, ah, oh, that's good. Science finally caught up with God. God never catches up to science. If you put your faith in science, science is continually changing. How are you enjoying global warming today? You understand? God's word is always true. So now they're upset with him and they're saying, you're you're reaping and you're threshing going through the fields. And they talk about the Sabbath and they give all the... Remember, remember here that he talks about, look, the Lord made the Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath. So then they look at it. So now this other thing comes along is that they're, they're, they're looking at this withered man's hand. In Luke's Gospel, the doctor Luke gives us the, the right hand here. And he says, stretch out your hand. Understand the faith that it took for this guy with the withered hand. He can say, no, I... I don't got it. No, I can't do it. You don't understand. It's been withered. Can't do it. Withered, withered hand guy. That's me. They call me Withers. That's it. 
I'm a nickname, man. That's what, that's what I am, all right? Call me Lefty, whatever. They just, that's what's happening here. I can't do that. But some brought that man there because they were bringing people to him for healings, and that was his greatest need. He fell to that time, and he says, stretch out, and he stretches it out. And what happens? They get indignant. The Pharisees get indignant. Because he healed on the Sabbath. Because their, their tradition tells them that, that healing is working. In fact, one of the 39 tenets of the Abroth, I think it's called, of, out of the Mishnah, the writing of the rabbis, one of the 39 says is that there'll be no healing on the Sabbath. First of all, there haven't been any healings going on. Since the end of Second Chronicles, and really the destruction with the temples over the years and the various conquests, what happens now when we get to the New Testament, now we see synagogues popping up. Those were houses of worship where ten devout men who were religious, who wanted to keep the law and had a Torah scrolls, can make a synagogue. That's why there's many synagogues even around the world to this day. So these men and these Pharisees, and that's where, where the Pharisee comes up. That was a certain uh, religious sect of the Judaism in that synagogue. And they, they say, no, this can't, you can't be easy. We came up with this rule. There's no healing on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, well, let me, is, is it right to do good on the Sabbath? Some of the other gospel accounts, it says, which one of you, if your ox falls into a well, will you not take him out? Well, the law even accounts for that. God established the Sabbath, but he also said, hey, look, if someone's dying, your ox is there. You can't just like, bummer. <laughs> can't be out on the Sabbath. Can't be doing this. That would be working. That would be, No. But yet, to show that He's the Lord of the Sabbath, which Jesus Christ said, He's now claiming to be God, folks. Now that I'm Lord of the Sabbath, He, he tells him that, that He's to be healed here. I'll ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good? Isn't it better to save life than to destroy it? It's a rhetorical question. They never really answer Him. But all the people are like, what's going on here? Understand this. I just Because we know the Word of God, because you at Calvary Chapel just... At, at the last uh, retreat, you know, a couple weeks ago there in Appleton, and, and listen to the other speakers, uh, and, and to listen to some of the guest speakers who came up and talked to me, says, man, I, I can tell who you people are, and, and man, they just, and as a pastor, it blesses me. It's hard not to say the word proudful, because then you think it's sin, but I, I don't know, we only have word, one word for pride in the English language, and that's pride, but in a humble kind of way, I, I'm blessed, but I am prideful. I'm blessed in the sense of that, that my, my, my commission that you would be the most well-loved and bed, best-fed sheep around. And from them to say, man, your people know the word. So much so for those of you who were around yesterday when we were in that, during that police emergency and we were working out at that church and the people from the church were there and they were doing some stuff and they're like, wow, your people know the word. And this couple is in their 80s and they part of this denomination when they were part of it when they actually used to teach and believe the Bible. And, and they, they were excited about the word of God and like, man, they were just, wow. They said, our, our youth group, the, the, the youth group is age 50 to 60. That's their youth group. <laughs> There's only a couple of people left in that youth group. Everyone's older than that, but that's their youth group, folks. And they were just sort of like, you guys want to come over here? We're just, where's the youngs? And, uh, uh, but they said they were just astonished as they were just talking. They said, wow, these are your people. Man, they really know, they know the Word. They have the Scripture. They know the Word. And so here's the thing that blesses me. But here's the thing. It's hard for us sometimes because we know the Word so well to realize, what would it be like to be so caught up in man's tradition? Now, I was a Christian scientist. I was my own God. That's a mind science. It's a cult thing. But maybe some of you who've come from other denominations, that when you started reading the Word of God, you start going, well, that, wow, that's not in the Bible. Where does God helps those who help themselves? I've, I've, I've heard that all the time, and it's, it's not there. I have people who read through the New Testament, because you know what I've, I've discovered in the Bible, in the New Testament? What? There's a lot of things that's not in there. <laughs> like, uh... Like what? Well, God helps those who help themselves. Penny saved, penny earned, you know. Uh, station time saves nine. and <laughs> Cleanliness is next to godliness. Good advice, but not in the Bible. I'm like, oh, right. I, I have a disconnect with that because I don't know what it means to be caught up in man's traditions. And to be to where you're earnestly seeking God. You want to be close to God, but then you get caught up. But now here comes the point. Well, now that I share with friends who may be caught up in certain uh, groups that, that are caught up in tr this tradition over God's Word, then they're the old and the new wine. Putting new wine into old wineskins. Well, I don't want that. You see, as long as I have plausible deniability, I'm just accountable for this. But you understand, you're going to go to hell 
You're going to send yourself there, not God. Not God. You are going to, you are going to choose because now you willingly are participating just as Romans tells us, Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3, that when they've done all the evil they can, they make up ways of doing evil, but some are actively willingly participating in the lie, in that deception. You would choose that tradition. It's my tradition to not eat meat on Fridays. It's my tradition to do these things. It's my tradition not to have any caffeine. It's my tradition to not... And all these things. There's one denomination. That they are not a cult, but they, they around the turn of the century or the last century, you know, the 19th and the 20th century. And they had a covenant that you don't go to the theaters. Now here's the thing, folks. When they made that covenant, they were talking about like going to the Ordway. The or- going to a live production theater. But as time went on, then the silent movies, then the talking movie, I mean, they're, they're, their whole concept of the beginning of this whole thing that we make a covenant not to go to the theaters because the theater's bad, it strolled into their denomination, into their group, into the silent movies, then the talking movies, and then everything else. But that was the original intent. Because the theater of that day was more vaudeville. It was burlesque. There wasn't that entertainment there. There wasn't a that. And that's when they, they would say, well, we're just keeping away from all theater. We're just making a blanket statement. It's, just, it's not good. It's not good. But yet, it goes on and on and on for a long period of time. People don't even know why. I have friends who are in this denomination, and they don't go to the movies. No, but they have an extensive video collection. <laughs> some of them don't go to movies, but they got the bootleg. And you know it's a bootleg, because some guy pops up... <coughs> Walking across the screen going. I have friends, man, that they can't even watch a regular movie, so they're so used to the bootleg movies. And so there's the thing that it comes down to, so is that they, they make this rule and this regulation, and it's, and it's man's tradition. And so understand why they're getting angry at Jesus. The other gospel account says, He comes against all our traditions. Yes! Let us, and just as we were encouraged at our last conference there, at our retreat, to just simply... Preach and teach God's Word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, book by book. Let's, let's just read through God's Word and, and, and go through it, and we, we dig these things out. He tells him to stretch out his hand in verse 10. To stretch out your hand. In verse 11, but they were all filled with rage. <laughs> rage. And discuss with one another, what might we, we do to Jesus? What well, must they do? To Jesus. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain. I like that. <laughs> Good sound effects there. To whom he also, again, he, he was having this time of prayer. Wait a minute. Jesus is God. Doesn't he know everything? Why does he need to pray? Those are some good questions. Some of the questions, and again, you read through chapter 7 this week, and if I don't answer them next week's uh, session, uh, sermon, then email me and I'll answer the questions, or talk to me after service, you can. But these are some good questions. And some ask, why did Jesus, in the last chapter, why did he always have to go to a deserted place or a a desolate place to go and to pray? It's why we come up with the word retreat. We need times of retreating. We need times of getting along with God or getting away and, and getting that top. We, we've now made a tradition or a, a, a slang or a vernacular, going to the mountaintop. We're going to have that mountaintop experience. Now, that's cool. That's cool. We can say, you know, I, I understand what you're trying to get across, but if you're going to use the Bible as a cross reference to that, Peter, James, and John try to set up tabernacles and stay on the mountain. And we all try to do that as well. I kid you not. I'm traveling back. We come back. Great retreat. Great conference, right? Amen? Amen, women? Should have been in my house when I got home and I played the voicemails. Satan was right there. I looked at the other brothers with me. I go, you can believe this? You're waiting for me. Praise God, I love technology. But not when it's used like that. Tell me to my face something like that, but someone actually could leave a message of just how vile and all the things. And then, well, then about a week later, he... Guy leaves another message. I'm, I'm sorry, I was off my meds or something. I don't know, just <laughs> drunk or whatever, and I'm just blaming you. And someone doesn't even come here. Been gone for you know eons, and all of a sudden, just I mean, I'm like, wow, praise God. I mean, that's what we call being in the valley. Going to the mountaintops to be in the valleys. But but understand this: he goes away to a deserted place because he needs to, he needs to pray. Remember, he is still 100 percent man. There are things that he 
divulge of himself. There's things that he divested. There's things that he left as God, in the plural, left in heaven. Yes, he can perceive and know what's on men's hearts and he can be aimed to those things, but yet he still needs to be quickened in his spirit by the Holy Spirit. Angels were sent to minister to him just like angels ministered to you and I. Jesus was just able to see them. But there are ministering angels coming. That's what they're designed for. They're, they're, not, they're not, not ones who are inherent salvation. God created them. He has a purpose for those angels. But Jesus was able to see them, and he has that, and, he, and he's able to get ministered. So he had to go to, if Jesus has to, how much more so you and I? Him being God and all, right? But he needed to be quickened. He needed to be built up. And there were some decisions that needed to be made. And he, and he goes all night and prays. Folks, maybe those of you who come from the Catholic persuasion, maybe I can help you with here. Jesus turned the water into the wine. But before that, Jesus, his mother, Mary, who everyone says, listen to Mary. Listen to Mary. Here's your witnessing tool for your Catholic friends. Mary said to everyone, the servant says, whatever Jesus tells you to do, do that. So there you go. I don't know why they're focusing on Mary so much. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, go do. Don't get hung up on his mother. You'll see her later. But you can't pray to her. She's not the co-redemptress of our salvation. Not one to be venerated. He even says he'll be blessed and honored among women. We know that in God's word. But she, there's nothing absolute she can do for you right now. When it comes to God's word here, what does Jesus tell us to do? Jesus, you want to be like Jesus? I mean, you do your own spiritual inventory. When is the last time, seriously, when is the last time you spent an entire night in prayer? Because of various decisions. And you might be agonizing over. Now we know there's the term, the agony in the garden of Gethsemane. And he sweat drops of blood. We know that he was, his soul and his spirit was just vexed there. But we're reading about Philip and Peter and James and John. I'm pretty sure there was some agonizing going over that as well. And he's on the mountain and he's praying. And he comes down and he makes decisions. Now he's going to make these guys apostles. Not be apostles. Apostles. And these are going to be the leadership of his, some would say, his movement. But these are guys that he's going to entrust himself to and he's still going to be disciples. So they're still disciples, but they're apostles and they're not so much elevated because what after that... What does he see the apostles doing? Carry this. Do this. Feed these people. Go and do likewise. You see me washing your feet? You go wash your feet. You see how I'm preaching? You go preach. You go and do these things. Now they've been entrusted with, with the ministry and they, they're, they're totally dependent upon the Lord. But there's still disciples coming around and he, and he does these. Now, you'll have to Google these names and, and you'll have to go and search these out through church history. We know that John lasted the longest. He lived a long life. Well... All the other apostles, well, Peter was like a little bit envious of that because Jesus told him how you were going to die, you're going to be crucified. What about John? And Jesus again says, what about John? You follow me. What if I'm to keep him alive until my return? And then it tells us there in one of the Gospels that everyone's like, ooh, John's going to stay alive. Do you think John was excited when he's put in a vat of boiling oil to be put to death and lives? Do you think he's sitting there like, I am really thankful. Jesus said, I get to stay alive and feel every little bit of this. And that he's banished to an island. That he's literally filleted alive and boiled alive in oil. And he didn't die. He's just not dying. Like the weebles. The weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. He's still, he's still going there. And God is keeping alive through every, you're going to feel it all. But all the others, by the time John's going through this, they're all put to death. Philip and Bartholomew, they'd gone to India and preached the gospel. Philip, church history tells us, was filleted alive and then died of exposure. You know what it is? In India, they have a way where the knives are so sharp, they were able to take his skin off. And there was Philip Tartar there. That was it. Just exposed. Every one of them were martyred. Martyred unto death except for John. He was just kept being martyred over and over and over. Usually martyrdom just works once. But it looks like he had the gift of martyrdom. 
And so here's the thing is that you go through and you look at these guys. Some, John, well, it tells us one of the other Gospels that he knew someone in the high priest's family. He was a connected kind of guy. You have the zealot, Judas Iscariot. You have that zealot. Actually, there's a couple of zealots in Jesus' crew, but we know of Iscariot. Those guys were vehemently opposed to anyone who worked with the Roman governors against the Jews. Well, then who else is in Jesus' crew? Made one of the apostles, Levi. Matthew, the tax collector. And people are, again, Jesus is known by the company he keeps and what he's continually being accused of. Look at the company you're keeping. Look at all this. And these are able to come together. And Jesus is able to, just as we sung in the song, Dave, this, this love that binds us all together. Just as the Apostle Paul says, it's the love of Christ that constrains me from doing any evil. But it's also in the next part of, of Corinthians, it talks about that same love, that love compels me to do good. That same love of Jesus Christ constrains me, keeps me from doing evil, but also compels me. That word compel means like a stick of dynamite in your britches and there you go. God compels. You're shot out of the cannon. It compels me. That's what the love does. Man, I used to travel... Well, I don't know how fast I went on my motorcycle. The speedometer only went up to 85. But I'm pretty sure I was doing 85 plus. So I could go see my baby on the weekends. I live in California. She lived in Arizona. I'm home. After three speeding tickets, two by the same trooper. Says, look, you're still in love? Yeah, fly. It turned out to be cheaper to fly. I just, I, that's what I'm talking about. Compels. Got to get there. Got to get there. It's the same way. It's that same love. Does that same love for one to the own spiritual inventory? When's the last time you really spent a night in prayer? Not, not just agonizing, oh Lord, I got this big thing coming. But I mean just simply communing before cell phones. Before cell phones and unlimited talking and all that kind of stuff like that. I'm talking in the early 80s, $300 phone bills. Kimberly and I would just lay there and talk to each other. and She'd fall asleep and I'd hear her sleep. Huh? You sleep? No, no, no. I love you. I love you. Goodbye. Goodbye. You hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. Which is cool because she's an only child living with a single parent, but I got two guy roommates. Go to sleep already! We love you too! Go to sleep! Hang up! No, I love you. We love you. That's what I mean. It's about the compel. So. Is my love still waiting? Is that my love? Is, is it just grown and mature? Is it sophisticated? Or is that same love? So here's this thing that when Jesus Christ is portraying you and I, He pours us out and picks these apostles. And then He comes down and He picks them. Understand this. This is not the Sermon on the Mount. And actually, if you read the Gospel of Matthew, it's really the teaching on the Mount. It's the teaching to His disciples. It tells us here that he came down, he picked us, and he came down to a level plain. And he began to teach them. Now, there's some same things there that are similar, and then there's a whole lot of other things that aren't, that aren't in gospel on the Sermon on the Mount or the teaching on the Mount. That's just not happening there. And, and now what's happening is we're on the Mount. He was teaching and discussing to his disciples at the beginning of his ministry. And Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is everything Jesus is going to do, everything he's about, his manifesto. Here's my vision statement Here's what this ministry is about. Here's what I'm about. Here's what we're going to do. And then he spent the next three years living it out. And then was murdered for it. And here's a sermon. Here's a preaching. Understand this. A sermon or a teaching are for believers. This Sunday morning, today is a teaching. Getting an expositional teaching upon the Word of God is for the believers. Preaching is for the lost. Preaching and proclaiming the good news and the gospel and doing those things Jesus comes down and he begins to preach. And he talks about, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now, it seems similar to that in the Gospel of Matthew. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about one in the present tense of one of like, this is the way we're supposed to be. Here he's actually talking to the poor in spirit. Here he is actually talking to those, Blessed are you, uh, men. Uh, are you men uh, that hate you when they exclude you and revile you and cast you out in your name do all kinds of evil things and do those things? That, that's what's going on. His teaching to His disciples in the Gospels, in Matthew's Gospel is one, look, these things are going to happen. But this is what we're supposed to be. This is how we're supposed to be. 
Here, Jesus is on a plane. You understand? It's different. It isn't like, oh, well, Luke has a little bit different detail. They came from the mountain. No, this is what some call the Sermon on the Plain. He's on a flat area. He's in a different location. And he's coming down from that night of prayer, and he makes the decision with these guys, introduces them. And I'm sure there's others going, uh, them? Just like many of you, your family looks at you and goes, them? You? And so here he preaches. He's teaching them. He's showing them things. And he's blessing them. And these are the words of the Lord. But he, he goes on to tell you and I. So again, from Matthew chapter 5, for the one of, of that of, of the new wine into the old wineskins, that could be you today. Maybe some guy, Do you know there's people who actually won't attend Calvary Chapel St. Paul because we meet in a hotel? They're embarrassed they can't bring family here. So they come and they'll go somewhere else. I've actually been called and told, says, when you guys get your own building, a little steeple and that kind of stuff, we'll be there. I was told that years ago. That's why we went on a garage sale, found this plastic little church. It's a money bank. I think, and we used to stick that in the window. Remember? Where's your steeple? Everyone would just, it's over there. <laughs> there you go. It's a church. You didn't say how big or what it looked like. Or... But you also know there's people who won't go to a church like that because they don't meet in a hotel. Because they don't. I mean, it can go the other way, folks. Oh, this is too religious. This is too that. That's, I can't handle that. Talking with some that I'm looking at some church buildings for sale. Some of them are. Church buildings like, oh, we can't do that. I'm like, oh, yes, we can. You know, free is free. You know, that's my price. We can do that. One church I'm looking at, if we get it, they'll let us keep the organ. <laughs> I'm talking eBay, baby. That thing's on eBay. <laughs> Because that's some coffee equipment. Organ, transplant, coffee, equipment. All right. <laughs> Come and get it. One friend moved into a Catholic church. It used to be a Catholic church. He sold off Mary <laughs> and Jesus and all the saints and all the windows. Made a lot of money. Sold off Mary. Had a sale for Mary. So do you understand? We can go the other way and say, oh, well, because we don't, you know, we're not on the cutting edge. You're not meeting, I can't meet inside that building. Well, we'll see. And every bit of change or something like that. Can there be the new wine and the old wineskins and those things? But as Jesus finishes up here, again, he speaks this parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Well, that wasn't in Matthew's gospel. Can the blind lead the blind? Look, God's word is meant to preserve, preserve you and I. Older men should teach the younger men. Older women should teach the younger women. There's some things there. As I counsel newly married people or premarital, I said, look, don't hang out with people who have been married just like you. It's the blind leading the blind. Go to people who've matured. Go to people who've gone through some things and, and ask them questions about those things. Because then when you're just asking someone who's at the same, say, the same level, and this is not just the marriage, this is anything, the same level, well, what worked out for you? Well, this worked out for me. Really? And then you can get caught up, and then the thing is, is well, so-and-so did that. Well, so-and-so did that. Maybe so-and-so never learned that that's not the right way to do things, and God has another plan, and you're looking at so-and-so. Don't be the so-and-so, and don't be a so-and-so. Be a student and a disciple of God's Word. And let it grow and, and nourish you and fulfill you. And, and again, verse 41 of Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, here he says, And why do you look at the speck of, in your brother's eye and do not perceive the plank in your own eye? If you get the whole word picture, plank, I mean, just... And you're going to try to get this little sliver. Matthew's Gospel, he talks about being hypocrites, but, but here this preaching... Understand, Jesus has now come down. He hasn't, this isn't the Sermon on the Mount. This isn't the teaching to his disciples. He's now come down and preaching. And who do you think it's affecting? Because he's really uh, calling it out as it is. This is what's going on here. You're, you're hypocrites. You're acting this way. You're all kind of pretending these things aren't happening, but they, but they really are. You're going around and trying to be spiritual specs so Keith, spiritual eye, and you're trying to go around and, uh, and inspect others, but look, this thing's going in your own life. Jesus often says, physician, heal thyself. I mean, you're going around and you're trying to do these things, but, but here's the other, here's the flip side. You can get so myopic and you can think, well, I've got to get myself perfected and ready before I can really go out and do the Word of God. That's just not going to happen. Here's what happens. Go out and do ministry. Go out and preach the Word of God. 
And do it to an eight-year-old. And you're preaching, and that eight-year-old goes, but what about this in your own life? Then you go, then you have a choice. Well, you don't understand. I'm older, mature. I can handle that pornography. Uh, you know, it's just art. It's just art to me. I only read it for the articles. Do you understand? These are the things that you can try to rationalize. But you see, when you're doing the ministry and you're called out, then you might be up all night praying. Then you get together with others and you start praying about it and you go, hey, is this really true of me? It doesn't matter who said it. Is this really true of me? And that's when you begin to learn. You can't just hide away and say, God, just fix all these things and then send me out perfect. How is that encouraging anyone? One of the things that encourages this fellowship is that I'm your pastor. Look what God's doing and has done here. And that you can go out and say, man, if you can, I can, that's the encouragement. But you go out and you do the ministry and then you're confronted or you're convicted. And, those, and remember, conviction draws us closer to the Lord. Condemnation pushes us away. So if you're isolated and you put yourself away and you're just to hold up and say, I can't do anything, I can't do anything, that's condemnation. Because the Lord wants you out serving. We're meant to be that way, communal and serving in the body of Christ and serving our brothers and sisters and doing those things. And by serving, someone might point out a flaw, might point out an inaccuracy in your life. A wise man receives a, a rebuke. Seven times he stumbles. A wise man stumbles seven times and gets back up. A fool stumbles and stays down. Well, if a wise man stumbles seven times and gets back up, I'm a super genius. I'm a successful failure standing before you today. And I am thankful and I am grateful that people have been willing and had the guts enough to just talk to me even before I was a pastor. But they began to talk to me. Maybe you can do these things. Maybe you can check these things out. Maybe this is in your life. A lot of correction in my life. But a wise man receives it. And then it can get tiring. And then if it gets tiring, you either quit, I'm just tired of changing, or you go, you know what? I'm tired of being confronted about the same thing over and over again. I, just, I gotta change. I gotta submit, I gotta obey God, and I just gotta change. And so here's the thing you go out and you do the work of the ministry. So much so, he calls it out, says, What does it benefit you? What, what is it to your credit if you love those who love you? He talks about loving your enemies. This was a hard one for me in the military. How do I love the one I'm going to kill? And I realized that God. Has called me. And again, the enemies and stuff like that. And I can love them. I can pray for them. Lord, I hope he knows Jesus. You see, it was snipers who led me to the Lord, who really had that final impact. I mean, many people were influenced my lives, but finally, because as a Marine, I could just flip a clip in and just spray a bush, and whoever dies, I could be a pilot who drops bombs from up in the sky. But snipers, they're up close and personal. Guys, I knew their motto was snipers reach out and touch someone. And that was their thing. And I said, how can you do that? How can you do that? And call yourself a Christian. He says, well, we pray. We know the laws that we're given. We know the orders we're given are obedient. And that person's the enemy. And look what they're doing. And they need to take their lives. I would say it's pretty much easy today to be in the military because it's pretty clear who the enemies are and stuff like that. I would think there's probably one war that I would think it was very hard to be a Christian in. And that was our American Civil War. There was Christians on both sides, folks. You read the autobiographies and things of Stonewall, Jackson, General Lee, and then on the north, Ulysses S. Grant, Abraham Lincoln, and you read about their prayers and the things that did. And both generals, you can read accounts of generals at Gettysburg or Antenum on the north and the side, their prayers before war. And these are flowing righteous prayers, and God, may your will be done, and we're going to do these things. And you're like, wait a minute. How can they both be Christians? But you know what? That's the carnality of man, that's man's pursuit. And what's going on? And so that, to me, would be the difficult one right there. But today it is, I know, I, with Islam and the various other countries and the things and what we're trying to do as Americans, like, I, I can't say that God's for America and ours is the righteous thing. But I'm talking individually. Does your relationship with God make you sure? I had to come to terms with it. Many thought that I was going to throw down my weapon, and I'm just like, well... Now I'm praying that God keeps me alive long enough for you to make your decision. What about that officer yesterday? He had to kill someone. And uh, contrary to what the news will tell you, we, the St. Paul Police Department, very professional, they didn't beat the guy up who finally surrendered himself, one of the perps who murdered the cop. They could have. 
They could have. I, I can tell you this in St. Paul's history, and you can look this up. In 1949, a man killed a cop. And, and, and here in St. Paul. And when they were trying to arrest him, he wouldn't come out from underneath the bed, so he resisted arrest. And the detectives unloaded all their 32s on him through the bed. And he was apprehended. That's really the last recorded case in 1949 that there could be anything for the St. Paul Police Department as something accredited as that they didn't do procedures. And if you go through the last few cops' death, and the officer was murdered yesterday, it was for Maplewood, Maplewood Police Department. St. Paul backed them up. But I understand is that he, he had to roll over. He had to fire. They had to shoot. And another officer had to shoot. You have to do those things. And I know many of officers, not just in this police department, but others that are Christians, and they, they carry that sword or that glock in a defense for yours and I's liberties. And we're thankful that they're on the line. We're thankful that they're do, doing the job, that we all don't have to walk around with sidearms and it's anarchy and we can do those things. That's because we want good pleasure why I do pay taxes and I'm, and I'm blessed and fortunate and I want to do that. But understand this, that we are to love our enemies. And I'll just give, I'll, I'll close with this. After a, a long trying day, I only put in a half day with that emergency yesterday. I was going to take the other 12 hours off. And as I finished up and after 12 hours of just grueling and intense and working with 300 officers from around the cities and the manhunt going on and finding evidence and all these things are going on in the staging area, I come home. Now it's going to take me longer to explain this situation than actually that it took. But I intended to cut my grass or my forest that day been planning on it, and it's growing in the rain and everything. It's growing. I planned it. It's just, that was the day I was going to cut it and do everything because I knew soon I'm probably going to get a letter from the city saying it's time to cut your grass. Just as a final reminder, you might not be, you might not realize this. It might have gotten by you. This is just a friendly reminder. <laughs> and so as I open up my door after twelve just grueling hours and, and the death of an officer and all these things, and I open the door, there was a piece of paper that someone must have slipped in my mailbox. And as I look at that piece of paper, it was face down. I go, man, probably one of my neighbors. I know who it is. It's probably a letter that's saying, you know, cut your lawn or like that. And I just, I'm just going to, and I, my thing was, I'm just going to pick this thing up and I'm going to just walk over there. Don't you realize what I was doing? I was serving God and someone died and who are you to do this stuff? Like, da, 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 just so you know. And I picked it. I almost didn't pick up the paper. I, said, I knew perception. I knew exactly what that piece of paper was. I almost didn't pick it up and go over there as evidence. But I said, I'd better do this because I'm just going to put this right back in their face. And I picked it up and it was for a remodeling company. <laughs> now I just, to my own chagrin here, was that loving my enemy? But here's the thing. By the time I was picking up that paper, I just said, this is so stupid. I'm saying it's taken longer for me to, to explain this. This is nanoseconds. Is it? But as I went through all that rage and I was bending to pick up that paper and remember what I'm going to teach this morning. Uh, <laughs> there's a couple, way the illustration, a couple ways the illustration could go. But, but here's the thing. Not just because I was going to teach you guys this morning, but because I was in God's Word and that verse was continually going through my brain all week long. I said, no, I can't just not do this because I'm going to teach this and I'd be a hypocrite. I've done that before. Uh, you know what? what? What's the big deal? Maybe they don't understand where I'm at. Maybe they don't realize it. And they're just, my, you know, it's above the regulation eight inches. So it's up 30 inches. So whatever. All right. 30 inches. I'm sure it's bothering. Maybe I need to be a better. I'll, I'll, I'll cut it on Monday. I'll, I'll do that. And, and, and I pick up that piece of paper. So I had already made peace with it all within a second. I made peace with it, and I just had love for my neighbor. And when I picked up that piece of paper, it turned out to be, it turned out to be a blessing. That's the end of the story, folks. It turned out to be a blessing. If I, it was still anger in my heart, well, there would be a rebuke where you thought it was before I finished the story. You, it would, you see, it's a matter, it's my heart. And then that, just that one second going from, I mean, and I'm talking rage, folks. Just, oh, incensed and... To just, you know what, I just, I, you know, I just got to be a better neighbor. I got to cut this yard. And yeah, even if, even if it is, and my heart was, what a bummer that I waited so long that my neighbor has to write a letter. It'll probably be there today, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. Just like there was a voicemail waiting for me on my answer. I'm, I'm ready for it. But, but you know, here's the thing. 
How can I really hate that person? How can I really do that? What credit is it to you to love those who already love you? What credit is it? It's none. And then again, he finishes up and he begins to preach them. He taught his disciples on the mount, but now he preaches to each and every one here. Look, what is it going to profit you? What about those who say, Lord, Lord? It's he who does the will of my Father. We can say, Lord, all we want, but it's he who does the will of my Father who will inherit heaven. How can you say to me, Lord, Lord, when you don't obey me? That's the, that's the blasphemy. That's the incense that should go on in Jesus' heart, but it doesn't. And we keep saying, we boast, oh, Lord, Lord. But then he goes on and he finishes up. And he tells them this, but what about the man who builds his house on sand? You've got to build your house on the rock and the foundation. Because those same storms are going to come, Christian or not, those same storms, the same, everything's going to come. Katrina hit, Christian and non-Christian. Terrorist, the Muslim terrorist attacks. I said it, the Muslim terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers happen to Christians and non-Christians. The sun rises on the evil and the good. The rain comes on the just and the unjust. But it's how you and I are living this out and living our lives that's going to set us apart. And not just to be set apart, but to be set apart for the Lord and what He has for us. So Lord, we come before you this morning. We ask that we all do a spiritual inventory in our own lives here today. And we ask, Lord, I ask that you do that inventory in my life and as you're doing with all my brothers and sisters here this morning, that we surrender all to you. We put the things that that cares this world in the garbage and have that visual picture that we'll literally have to crawl through the garbage to find those things again if we really want to really want to take them upon ourselves again. But as Luke gives us the narrative here and, and just all the things that are going on in the Lord, may we just take and glean from you, Lord. You tell us, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. Lord Jesus, you've come to show us the Father and what he is like. Holy Spirit, you show us to Jesus. So, Jesus, may we be more like you. We just praise you. We thank you. And ask your blessings upon this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.